you, Rick, for that kind introduction. All right, I can balance my drink here. Ah, well, that'll teach me to sneak in at the last second. Uh, Rick surprised me by talking fast. I understand you've got a tape here, then I get to talk. Russian launch went very well. They placed us within 400 meters of where they were predicting us to be, which is outstanding. Nobody could ask for anything better than that. Aerospace history was made by a local company this morning when an experimental spacecraft blasted into orbit atop a rocket. We've got some great news. It is healthy, it is alive, so. Right, it looks like we're going to have a place to go to. Low cost. Excuse me, 
I'm sitting down here <laughs> instead of standing up. It was very laid out when I finally got back off the airlines. Uh, but I digress. Um, one of the interesting things about this business, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong place in my speech. Oh, uh, uh, right, right, I've got to get in the plug. The Space Access Society runs a conference, too. I'm still in charge of that. Uh, every spring in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Space Access 07, you know, uh, really, really thrilling the original name, but it lets you know what it is and when it is. Uh, we'll be in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, years and years ago, Rick Tumlinson, Rick Tumlinson and I worked out a deal. We would support each other's conferences and not step on each other's schedules, and it's worked out pretty well. Uh, if I deal with the rest of the field, but oh well. Uh, one of the things we're doing with Space Access this year in order to get it into a slightly less crowded time in the season, we're moving it up a month. Uh, we're going to be in late March rather than late April. Uh, late March is a great time to be in Phoenix. Uh, weather's, uh, weather's nice. Hotel rates are a little higher, but we've probably got a deal on that anyway. Ho contract's not quite final. Uh, will it either be second to last weekend in March or last weekend in March, uh, the usual Thursday schedule. And I hope you all can be there. Uh, Right, why we're here this morning. Uh, getting there is key. Space access, I mean, that, that's obvious. You know, Space Access Society has been pushing on that for a long time. Uh, the part that makes it interesting is, is, is getting there affordably is key. Uh, the part that makes it interesting is that a long time ago, a bunch of us saw the possibility that getting there affordably was a real possibility if you could get the transportation industry set up separately from the uh, existing uh, large bureaucratic aerospace uh, complex, which has more or less inherently high prices and long lead times. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that at this point, enough people agree with us who have, to the extent that they've been putting their talent and, and money and time into it, that there's a thriving industry of borning. Uh, we don't have, well, actually, I've seen a fair number of representatives of the industry here who aren't speaking, and it's a, it's, it's a bit of a shame, but you know, there's only so much time in the session, and it was, it was more or less. You know, we've, we've got a semi-random sampling of some of the finest the industry has to offer. Uh, well, the good news is that's about all I have notes for on the speech. Our, our first speaker, uh, appropriate enough to get to Vegas, um, is one of the finalists in a seriously high-stakes game, the NASA COTS competition with a half billion dollars at stake for alternative manned transportation to low orbit. Um, no, no, without further ado, I'll get myself off here and get somebody organized and interesting up here. I'd like to introduce Jim Benson of Space Dev. <laughs> while, while Jim gets up here, a quick, a quick word about format. We are tight for time. We've got five speakers. We're going to look to get about 20 minutes apiece. And at that point, we're going to have to sharply limit questions. I'm going to ask them to take three questions each and then move on to the next speaker. Anyway, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Henry. Uh, it's nice to be here. I actually uh, started in my space career by attending the Space Frontier Foundation Conference in Hollywood uh, in September of 1996 and met a lot of other uh, entrepreneurs about uh, starting a business. I uh, had cashed out in 1995 after 30 years in the computer industry and uh, was looking for something new to do and it seemed to me that uh, space was the next place to go, a hundred billion dollar a year in industry bogged down in the old mainframe way of thinking and I thought I would uh, introduce some modern concepts into the, um, into the industry. I don't have the little clicker here so can I have the next, uh, next slide? Uh, this is a phrase in 1996, uh, probably from Rick, space is a place, not a government program or not a NASA program. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really important when you think about it. You know, this is our frontier. Uh, it's not a government program. I'm pressing the enter button and it's not moving. Next slide. Next slide. All right, I also believe that space is the infinite frontier and that Opportunities are infinite. Next. I also think that space will make the world's next trillionaires. And next. In uh, 19, uh, 
In the year 2000, I put together our 20-year program because I realized that even though I was all in in terms of my personal commitment and uh, my modest fortune, that in order to build a self-sustaining uh, human settlements in space uh, profitably, that I needed to build uh, building blocks in order to get to the bigger vision. So this graph has been on our website since the year 2000, and it shows our progress in building a private space program uh, one technology at a time. In the lower left is uh, high-performance uh, microsatellites operating on the Internet. SpaceDev has been a spaceflight company for uh, three and a half years, and I can identify with Bob uh, when you do your first launch. It really is uh, uh, like giving birth, standing on the side and watching the, the, uh, the launch vehicle take off. It's a pretty awesome sight. Uh, space, uh, our Chipsat satellite was designed for a mission of 12 months. We're still fully operational after uh, 42 months. And we reduced our mission control and operations center down to a notebook computer anywhere in the world that has a dial tone. Uh, we think that's uh, fairly revolutionary. Also, nothing on Chipsat had ever flown before, so that flies in the face of the uh, industry uh, belief that you can only fly uh, hardware and software that has heritage. Chipsat had no heritage in any of the hardware or the software. Uh, we've also been working on orbit maneuver and transfer vehicles. Uh, for the last uh, four years, we've uh, built two of them, one under contract to the NRO, the other one to the Air Force Research Lab. And, of course, manned suborbital propulsion. We developed and delivered all of the rocket motors uh, that made the world's first civilian astronauts in Paul Allen Spaceship One. Next. I guess, uh, what did I do with it? All right, the yellow boxes are uh, first phase contracts. We have uh, a manned suborbital contract we had with NASA Ames, unplanned planetary, uh, planetary lander mission concept and design with uh, Lunar Enterprise Corporation, solar thermal water propulsion module. We've done uh, two studies and one prototype on that. Uh, humans to orbit is uh, also tied into our uh, human spaceflight program. Robotics, we have one of the leading roboticists space in the world on our staff. And by the way, we've grown from one person in 1998 to over 200 today. We're at $25 million per year of business. Uh, we're profitable, we're debt free, we're publicly traded. Our stock's $1.30. And uh, did I say we're publicly traded? The uh, upper right hand corner manned uh, lunar landings. We did that uh, study last year, and I'll have a video on that in a little while, uh, also for Lunar Enterprise Corporation. The yellow just came online, Microsat launch vehicle. Uh, we're under two contracts, the Air Force Research Lab, to do our own expendable launch vehicle. We're working on the booster in the second stage now and hope to do the uh, booster test firing uh, within the month. And by this time next year, we'll have done the booster. The booster would also be used on our human spaceflight capability as proposed uh, to NASA under the COTS program. Rendezvous and proximity operations, we've been working on that for about a year and a half under two contracts. Docking, uh, we have the mechanism on Orbital Express, which will be launching this fall. And uh, let's see, next is, where should I, are there, oops, all right. The uh, white boxes that popped up are uh, refueling on orbit, unplanned, uh, uh, unmanned planetary exploration, cargo to orbit. Those are the next steps we believe we'll be working on and then uh, up above in the blue writing. Uh, space resource extraction, fuel depots on orbit, refueling the space resources, commercial space are linked together one after the other, and we're getting there uh, one step at a time. And then finally, the ultimate of where we're trying to go is self-sustaining human settlements on orbit and, belong, and beyond, and I think uh, uh, Bigelow Aerospace is, uh, is important for providing uh, destinations, and we hope to uh, be working uh, with them as we develop our human spaceflight capabilities. Um, what I'm going to do here is uh, video of a few of the technologies that we've already developed. We need sound on this, please. Uh, this is Chipsat. I mentioned uh, it's a large uh, uh, suitcase-sized satellite that we developed uh, for NASA and uh, the Berkeley team. Here's some of the proud fathers. Here's the launch uh, in January of 03 on a Delta II from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. And as I said, it's uh, still operating perfectly. I should appreciate some uh, sound. Let's get the sound going. This is what we think it looks like on orbit. I'll just uh, stop the presentation until we get sound after this. 
Uh, this is our maneuvering and orbit transfer vehicle with uh, hybrid rocket motors with the intelligence of chipset added to it on the uh, uh, solar panels. Uh, here's one of our rocket motors test firing, uh, burning uh, plexiglass and uh, nitrous oxide. We provided the spaceship uh, one propulsion the signing party. These are the three motors for the X Prize attempt. Everybody in the company signed the nozzles. This is uh, now in the Smithsonian Institute. And uh, here's one of our uh, rocket motor test firings. This is the largest rocket motor of its kind in the world. We developed it in uh, less than a year for less than a million dollars. This is straight up, 15 seconds, first powered flight, first private vehicle to exceed the speed of sound. And we're really missing a lot by not, by not having uh, We're working on our own small launch vehicle, a couple cartoons. That's the air launch version. This is the ground launch version. And uh, this is a Dream Chaser manned spaceship. Uh, this is a slightly different configuration from what we're uh, proposing uh, today. This is the suborbital launch uh, that will be operational about 18 months after uh, starting work on it. These are three satellites we're developing for the Missile Defense Agency, three launched together, an Esper ring or in a Falcon. I think you know that we've ordered three Falcon launch vehicles and we're manifested for our first uh, uh, flight in early uh, next year. These are the three satellites uh, flying in parallel, networked in, uh, on orbit. Uh, that'll be another first of uh, local area networks of microsatellites uh, flying in formation uh, on orbit. So what are we gonna do about the sound? Uh, is there sound on the video? Or? Yeah, there is, and uh, we'll just uh, wait here until you get work. Now the video's over, but there are more coming up. So is it going to work now? Uh, yeah, they're just uh, having it up all the time. There'll be a pause in the video. I don't know what this is. No, it's the same one again, but uh, let's skip it. This controller does not work, guys. Advancing the slide, and it's not advancing. Next slide. All right, uh, I'm just going to whip through these very quickly. These are examples of low-cost space dev missions and developments. Next slide. Uh, I started off the company by having a study done at UCSD in 1997. We found that we could do uh, deep space science missions for one-tenth the cost of NASA. Next. Uh, we got a contract from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory looking at Mars micro missions. Uh, missions to Mars, uh, small missions that were costing $500 million at the time. We determined they could be done for around $25 million in our study for JPL. Next. Then uh, Boeing funded us to look at a uh, commercial version of that as a lunar orbiter, uh, data relay, uh, streaming, uh, high-definition def high TV uh, back from uh, the orbiter uh, with a camera controlled by people over the Internet. Next. Uh, Chipsat, uh, we were told before we started on the program that uh, build a satellite for less than $40 million. Uh, we did it for seven and a half million, and as I mentioned before, everything on it was new, and uh, eight, 12 month mission life, and after 42 months, we're still operating perfectly. Next. Uh, lunar lander, uh, the most recent uh, NASA attempt was RLAP-2, Robotic Lunar Exploration Program, uh, mission number two, originally scheduled for uh, uh, $400 million. As soon as it was awarded, uh, it was jacked up to $750 million, or a billion, that's likely to be canceled. And uh, our study shows that you can do low-cost lunar landers at the South Pole. We're on a peak of eternal light, uh, giving you a lot of um, uh, energy year-round, uh, a benign environment, relatively speaking, um, access to uh, Earth in a direct line of sight, and also to deep space for uh, doing uh, astrophysical or astronomical uh, observations. Uh, next, please. For about uh, uh, 40 million versus 400 million. This is a program we won through John Mankin's program about a year and a half ago, $18 million total for a mission to fly to the Lunar L1 point uh, as versus uh, $100 million or more uh, for NASA's lowest cost lunar mission ever. Uh, so you, then this uh, mission was, uh, and 80 others were canceled in order to sweep up all these uh, pitiful little millions of dollars and uh, give them to the large companies to develop uh, the CEV, which will probably never see the light of day. Next. Uh, this is a basket nanosatellite uh, under contract uh, to the uh, Air Force Research Lab. 
It's got uh, extreme capabilities in terms of orbit changing, uh, rendezvousing, uh, uh, autonomous operations, and it has multiple sensors on it that I can't discuss. Next. These are the three satellites uh, we're building. Uh, for the Missile Defense Agency, this total contract is $43 million, and uh, that includes uh, up to six satellites. They're shown here in the uh, ESPER ring configuration as a second launch, which probably isn't going to happen next. Uh, and that's why we bought the uh, Falcon 1 launch vehicles from uh, SpaceX. And here's, uh, this was kind of interesting because during the Aldridge Commission, the uh, person testifying before me was from Rocketdyne. And he testified that his company had created the only new rocket motor in the United States in the last 40 years, that it only took 10 years, it only cost $500 million, and for $200 million more, they would man rate it. Uh, and then I was next, and I said, well, gee, uh, we developed a new rocket motor in the United States in less than a year for less than a million dollars, and we're already flying people on it. Next. Uh, this is the family of small launch vehicles we're working on uh, under contract to the Air Force Research Lab. Next. Uh, this is just a, uh, a frame out of the um, animation of our suborbital space tourism uh, using the Space Dev Dream Chaser. Uh, and let me just say something about this, uh, since COTS was already mentioned and the decision will be made before the end of August. Uh, we started working on human spaceflight back in the year 2000 because we were already involved in the Spaceship One program uh, with Paul Allen. And I recognized at the time uh, how fast we were moving and how much the team was, uh, was accomplishing. Let me just remind you, there were three major technologies that went from concept to man in space in a period of less than three years for less than $30 million, from concept to space for a large, ungainly, complex, twin-engine carrier, the White Knight One, to a spaceship for three people to go to space and back, and for the world's largest rocket motor of its kind. All of those things from concept to reality in three years for less than $30 million. That's pretty amazing. And that's what convinced me that Space Dev could do its own um, manned uh, vehicle, but the only way we could do it was to use an existing design. So in 2000, we chose the, uh, or 2001, we chose the NASA X-34, which had been abandoned at the same time as the X-33. Uh, and then we uh, were able to get a Space Act agreement with uh, NASA Ames, and we looked at, uh, we did a lot of detailed modeling of re-entry from orbit, and we determined that the X-34 leading edges and nose were too sharp and would heat up too much. So on the uh, NASA's recommendation, uh, our team, uh, Dryden and, and Ames, we started looking at the HL-20. The HL-20 is very interesting because NASA Langley reverse engineered the horizontal landing 20 Russian BOR-4. The Russian BOR-4 was launched to orbit four times and successfully re-entered and was uh, picked up uh, in the ocean three out of four times. The fourth time, uh, they just couldn't get to it in time and it sank. So this was a lifting body design with heritage that's been to space and re-entered, and NASA reverse engineered it and called it the Personnel Launch System or Space Taxi, the HL-20. Uh, we sort of rediscovered that a couple of years ago uh, when we were doing the studies uh, with NASA Ames and moved from the X-34 to the HL-20, which we call the Space Dev uh, Dream Chaser. So uh, we knew at that point that all we had to do was take an existing design fabricate it and add our existing rocket motors to it, and we've got suborbital space tourism. Uh, then uh, COTS came along, and we thought, uh, okay, maybe orbital is just as important or more important in the long run, but that's okay because we have a vehicle that was designed to go to orbit and back with eight people. So the original HL-20, depending on the, the contractor, was designed for eight or ten. We reduced it to six to reduce the weight and uh, make it more maneuverable. Uh, and to give a 1,800 mile cross range when it's coming in for a landing. Space Dev has the only piloted vehicle in NASA's future. Everything is a capsule, unpiloted, uh, astronauts will be passengers. Space Dev has proposed the only piloted vehicle in NASA's future. Next. Next. Let's see if we have sound. Apparently not. Just turn it on and leave it on, please. Well, I can't do that because it will ruin the no. rest of it. I'll be back here tomorrow. I'll just talk louder. But I've still got enough. How do you go back a slide? Will you go back a slide, please?
All right, tell me when you have it, please. All right, go back. Well, this is really a shame because the uh, the animation after this one has got. Uh, uh, I think the music makes it more than the animation does. So y you all are being deprived. All right, never mind. Let's just go with it. We're running out of time. We're running behind. No, thank you. <laughs> but I know you play the piano well. Feige. Uh, uh, you didn't have to do that. They can hear me. But, but thank you. I, w I would like to thank Jeff Feige and his entire crew who put this thing together. Um, just, just, you know, it, it is an awful lot of work and a necessary sure. job. All right, so what are we going to do? Just hold a microphone by the speaker or something? Sure. All right, so let's. That'll work. Let's just, let's skip this one and go to the next one, all right? Because we're going to see the launch anyway. So go ahead to the next one. And hold it on the next slide because I want to... How is this happening? This is not the music for this. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Have you got this one? No. All right. This is uh, a alternative way of getting people to the moon. It's not a hundred and four billion dollar uh, Apollo on asteroids, uh, on steroids. Uh, basically, it relies uh, originally on SpaceX uh, launch vehicles, but we don't need those anymore if Space Dev wins COTS because that will give us our own heavy launch vehicle uh, able to lift thirty thousand pounds to uh, to orbit. So the concept here is we launch a stack of production units and a Bigelow module uh, in low Earth orbit, having already put a Bigelow module on the surface of the moon. It's checked out, ready, waiting for people. And now we're taking the second one to the moon with people in it so that they can ride in luxury on the way to the moon. And every time we go, we're building up a base by adding another uh, habitat. So the, the concept is we put the stack in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, in low Earth orbit, and then we fly the Dream Chaser six-passenger vehicle, unload uh, 
uh, through the back end of the Dream Chaser into the Bigelow habitat. The Dream Chaser undocks and then the stack takes off for the moon uh, and when it gets to the moon, it separates the Bigelow module lands and then uh, the people, the four people inside, put on their spacesuits. They go out through the hatch on the, Dream, on, on the Bigelow module. They strap themselves into individual uh, ascent modules called alohas and they basically fly themselves down to the surface of the moon. They do the work, get back onto their rocket chairs and launch back up to orbit, dock uh, with the capsule and come home to a safe return and there are abort uh, capabilities at every step of the way and I'm really sorry you're not going to get music on this because it's, um, it's really great. So let's just go to the next slide. This uh, study that we did for Lunar Enterprise Corporation uh, was uh, premised that technology in here is already existing or it's already being developed under contract. And that's really important. It's, that's one of the reasons that these uh, manned lunar missions can be gotten down to a range of less than 10 billion for the first one and maybe one or two billion for each after that. So this is uh, Space Dev uh, Dream Chaser uh, HL-20 uh, launching on safe non-exploding hybrid rocket motors, uh, getting up to low Earth orbit with a uh, pilot and four uh, moon-bound uh, passengers on board. This is the rocket motor we're currently developing right now under an Air Force contract. Uh, these small rocket motors are uh, internal to the Dream Chaser and already built and flown on uh, Spaceship One. Uh, the Dream Chaser will be fabricated for us by Adam Aircraft uh, in Denver, which has the largest, most modern composite manufacturing facility in the world. And now the four people are transferring um, uh, in their shirt sleeves out of the Dream Chaser into the Bigelow module and now the whole stack is uh, ready to uh, be propelled uh, to the moon. Uh, Atom Aircraft also uh, is the first company in 40 years to get a new airplane, new twin engine plane certified uh, through the FAA and uh, they designed and manufactured it and gotten it certified within three years and they've got the facility to uh, build Dream Chasers uh, here from scratch. So a proven vehicle design, a proven fabricator, and proven rocket motors. Uh, we just can't think of a uh, less risky, less expensive, uh, safer way of uh, getting people to low Earth orbit and to uh, Earth orbit. All right, so now we've got the capsule uh, with uh, the four people in it, the uh, un unmanned uh, Bigelow module, uh, mates with one of our orb uh, maneuvering transfer vehicles. Uh, we've already developed uh, two of those as I mentioned before and now the people transfer out through an airlock. They sit down in the chair and uh, basically this is uh, probably the most fun and exciting part of the adventure is uh, being just out there uh, landing yourself. So here's the earlier Bigelow module and a new one uh, waiting. So each time we go we uh, add to the base camp. This is the previously landed uh, International Lunar Observatory. Uh, that does both uh, astrophysical or a astronomical research and uh, provides communications. This is the human servicing mission and this is the human servicer. Uh, basically switching out a box or changing payloads or upgrading the, um, uh, the uh, International Lunar Observatory and then back to the rocket chairs, uh, back to lunar orbit. Uh, and the, by the way, these rocket chairs were, um, were uh, concepts and preliminary designs were done uh, back in the uh, Gemini and Apollo days, so we, we're just copying some ideas and bringing them up to date. So here we go uh, back to Earth um, with a propulsion module attached, and we'll do an aero uh, braking uh, maneuver to cut a lot of the velocity. So there's the uh, heat shield coming around. Now we're uh, cutting that motor on the back end is to circularize. That's another one of our hybrid uh, maneuvering and orbit transfer vehicles. Chaser has already been launched uh, as the people were leaving from the moon. It's been waiting in orbit. Uh, we want to have everything in place before any humans are transferred anywhere. Uh, that capsule can be reused and now uh, Dream Chaser uh, does a, uh, a re-entry and this is well within the uh, thermal protection systems uh, available today. This is similar to the shuttle except it's a lot lighter, a lot uh, less expensive, can tolerate more heat even though we don't generate it. Uh, it's uh, less than one.
of the surface area, and we have 1,800 kilometer cross-range capability. We can land at any commercial airport anywhere in the world uh, as long as it's got a 10,000 foot runway. Uh, next. Uh, space is going to pay, and uh, we are going to stay, and we're going to do it in our lifetimes. Thank you. Well, I, I, I hate, to, hate to approve of such a thing, but Jim managed to slide off without any questions. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to talk to him in the lobby afterwards, but you know, we're running late, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, always trying to make up time on one of these programs. Our next speaker is, is Neil. We're not presenting in the order on the program, but that's all right. We're going to get to the same fine set of people. Uh, Neil Milburn of Armadillo Aerospace. Uh, are you in the room, Neil? All right, we've got a speaker. Uh, I'll let Neil tell you what the story is. Armadillo has been up to interesting things lately. Um, they're, they're in a different kind of a competition, and I'll let Neil tell you about it. Did you resolve the... Uh, the you, won't have sound. Uh, yeah. you won't have sound? Yeah, let, let's wait a couple of seconds, because the... Uh, I don't have that same struggle that, uh, that Jim did. Okay, sorry about the, uh, the technical difficulties there. Uh, Armadillo Aerospace, I'm not sure how many of you guys even know about Armadillo Aerospace, so when I was putting this together at about one o'clock this morning, uh, I pulled
pulled some, uh, some bits and pieces. This is the third conference in, uh, in one week, so I've been using the same, same presentation, just pulling slides backwards and forwards. Uh, you want to hit the magic button there? Have I got one of those things to forward this with? Yeah. Oh, keep going. Armadillo, who, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a Dallas-based 21st century group of bicycle mechanics. We're basically an R&D house. Um, we started uh, about six years ago, it seems like. Uh, John Carmack, who uh, some of you may know from his id software fame, and you guys play Quake or Doom, we appreciate your contributions because that's what's financing uh, Armadillo Aerospace. Uh, Russ, uh, Russ, Phil, and myself were the other three founding members six years ago. We're still all volunteer. It amazes me that we've been able to do what we have uh, in this time frame with just an all-volunteer organization. Two days a week. We work Tuesdays uh, and, uh, and Saturdays uh, for about 26 hours each day. You want to hit the button again there? Our regular citizens by day and steely-eyed missile men by night. We, you know, we all of us have our day jobs. John still runs uh, id software. Uh, I teach uh, an international baccalaureate physics course in, uh, in, in Plano, just north of Dallas. We have a couple of guys that run a pager company. Anytime you go in those restaurants and they make you wait and give you a little pager, uh, it's the guy that invented those things. Um, we've got a guy that teaches welding, which is obviously very useful. Uh, general contractors, a lot of different, uh, different skills brought to the team. And initially, we started this. It was just a group of guys got together for a, for a hobby. Um, we're, uh, we were working on rocket-powered, computer-controlled hovering vehicles. Uh, and I'm glad to see uh, Mr. Aldrin here. He's one of my heroes as well. In fact, he's probably one of the reasons that I'm standing here today. And Buzz, have we an opportunity for you? This is a real deal coming up. I uh, hit the button again, and I think this might be uh, yeah, a five-minute version of Armadillo Aerospace's five-year history. Hopefully, we've got the sound for this, or else it'll be... Uh, I'm going to grab the sound Gone too far. I got it. Doesn't look like we've quite technical difficulties. <laughs> the kind of scale we started off on. It really was just a bunch of guys getting together to, uh, to fly small hardware.
guys get a chance to fly uh, Peter Diamandis' uh, Zero G plane, that is an absolute blast. The entire team up sometime about a year and a half ago. That actually gives you an idea of how uh, that, um, that video is. It was right uh, right after Bert and his boys won the uh, won the original X Prize. Uh, we were somewhat peeved that he took out ten million dollars, but uh, but Bert, Bert's. Uh, but it's a fantastic engineer. He was way ahead of the curve on uh, on us. But I think when that X Prize was announced, um, he already had a lot of hard behind the curtains there at Mojave that he wasn't uh, wasn't letting on about. You want to click on another slide there? Uh, where we're at now? That was the history part of it. Uh, between then and now, we uh, we developed this vehicle, the VDR Vertical Drag Racer. Um, we have a permit application that's been ruled substantially complete by, uh, by FAA AST for this vehicle, so we'll be working through the, uh, uh, the details on that. We were originally going to fly this thing as our uh, a challenge uh, Lunar Lander. Um, it was a vehicle we had built for a different application, as you can imagine from the, uh, the name Vertical Drag Racer, where we were talking with some folks about uh, uh, the guys at XCOR are going to have the Rocket Racing League and have those uh, rocket-powered planes whizzing around. Uh, and while they're doing that in the middle of the field, we were going to start uh, start drag racing these. And I think I've just about cajoled uh, Dave Masson and his guys into a, a competition probably within within the year. X Prize Cup 2007 will uh, will frighten George Neal and his folks uh, by uh, by trying to get a permit for no problems with flying two of these side by side in front of 20,000 people, George. Right? Good. Um, this this vehicle is uh, is ready to fly, and then we put it on the sidelines. But you want to hit the couple of more times there, perhaps one to start with. Yeah, it's it's a large scale uh, test bed for our vertical takeoff, uh, powered landing technology. Um, that uh, little bitty piece that we flew on the hundred acres out east of uh, of Dallas there, that was our first really successful boosted hop with the uh, with the technology. Uh, this is the, the large sister vehicle to it. Uh, do you want to hit that black dot by the static engine test? Oh, no, back one. There you go. Hit the static engine test, see if that'll uh, fire up. Uh-oh, all sorts of strange things happening. Uh, it was the uh, horizontal engine test. The, that's the latest Lox kerosene engine. It was a, that was one of the very early ones. It's still got a lot of film cooling going on there. It's an ablative engine, uh, but there's no ablation at all at the moment. Uh, and after that short little burp test, we, uh, we strapped it onto the, the vertical racer and then took it out to our 100-acre property. This is probably the last test we'll ever do out there. We just about frightened some guy's horses to death, and they were trying to jump fences. Uh, it's still not ready to fly. We, we're, uh, we're one of the instigators of the, uh, of the ruling from AST on tethered flights. Uh, this is not even tethered. We have it hanging from a tether, but it's also tied off to all four corners while we're just checking out the, uh, the, the gimbal in response. Um, this, this is a, a single gimbaled engine with attitude control from, from coal gas thrusters. So you hit that vehicle tie down test. It was also the longest run that we had from, uh, from this one. reasons that I'll, I'll talk about in just uh, another slide. Uh, we, we may not fly this vehicle at the X-Prize Cup this year. We're going to replace it with, uh, with a slightly different version.
still way too much film cooling on that thing. We've got to start dialing that down. And back to the presentation. Uh, I hit one more slide. We said we're not going to probably fly this. The reason is, I'll hit the button one more time. Uh, it was marginal for the level two. For those who are not familiar with the, uh, with the, the NASA challenge, uh, and, and originally this was going to be DARPA and NASA. I understand DARPA's funding's tied up in, in Congress. So it's NASA, uh, but at least for the moment. Hopefully they'll get this resolved. Uh, it was marginal for the level two performance. Level one, we have to uh, lift the vehicle up from pad A to a height of about 50 meters, translate 100 meters and set it down on pad B. Uh, it had to remain in the air for, uh, for 90 seconds. That vehicle will handle that easily. Uh, the level two challenge is basically the same, but it has to remain airborne for, uh, for three minutes to demonstrate delta V capability. Uh, this one was on the ragged edge. We'd have to make a little bit more improvement to the, the engine performance. Uh, which wasn't, wasn't out of the question, but there were some other things that happened about the same time, so one more. Uh, we found out from our buddies at XPRIZE and, uh, and NASA that they were going to make the, uh, the level two landing pads, we're going to put a slight slope on them, and one more button should tell us the other thing. Are you going to hit that button? Uh, they're going to put some three-foot diameter boulders on there as well. I don't know if you had to contend with any of those buzz when you were landing on the, uh, on the roof. Uh, actually, we're going we're to get rid of those. We're just going to hover over it for about 30 or 40 seconds and blow the sucker away before we set down. <laughs> uh, and one more time. So space access, April 2006, this year, we decided we were going to build a true lunar lander vehicle just for the NASA Centennial Challenge. Uh, with that, uh, that original vertical drag race, it's got a really uh, shallow tip over angle, like 15 degrees, uh, 15 to 17 degrees, depending on how much fuel's in there. So it's no, not really set up for, uh, for, for the lunar lander competition as such. So we, we pulled out some napkins. I say, we, I couldn't make the uh, space access this year. Sorry, Henry. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we did our detailed design in about five, 10 minutes of, uh, of the quad. Next slide. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the concept vehicle. It's a little bit more like a, a lunar lander now. Four tanks, uh, two locks, two, uh, two alcohol, all of our control gear on stop. Uh, and in fact, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, hit the button again. Uh, it's for 10 weeks down the road. The vehicle is built. Um, it's not just a concept anymore. In fact, we were hoping, actually I'm glad we didn't, we were hoping to go to Oklahoma Spaceport and, uh, and do some extended duration runs. But the test on Tuesday night that I also missed because of conferences was, uh, uh, wasn't exactly what we wanted, so we're going to hold off for, uh, for another week. Next slide. Uh, but it is built. There's the vertical drag racer sitting beside it. That's sidelined for the, the time being. The, uh, the focus now is solely on the, uh, on the lunar lander. First one's built. Second one is in construction. We're going to fly two of them, one for level one and one for level two. Next one. Uh, we had a teeny-weeny engine problem while we were developing the, uh, uh, developing the quad. It has to be uh, a little bit more thrust. It's actually capable of 4,000 pounds. Uh, and then as I was doing the permit application for George and his folks up at, uh, at Washington, uh, we realized that um, even with a one kilometer distance from the crowd, that uh, our vehicle could reach out and touch someone. So we, we backed off on the thrust a little bit to 3,400 pounds. The problem we had was the engine was wanting to burn at both ends, which is not conducive or the people that want to sit on top of it. Uh, but we managed to, uh, to resolve that. This is a, an old slide from, uh, from the RASTA conference earlier this week. And one more. And again, quad, it weighs in at just about a ton and a half when it's fully loaded for the level two flight again. Uh, so we've dialed the engine down to 3,400 pounds so we don't, uh, don't end up killing half of, uh, of XPRIZE Foundation's clients. And again, uh, so much noise. And one more slide. And again. What next? The, uh, obviously, our prime focus. Uh, hit the button one more time. Is is uh, we're solely focused now on the on the Lunar Lander Challenge prizes uh, until October. That's uh, that's our sole occupation. Um, probably after that, early part of next year, we'll take the VDR out and do some uh, do some uh, powered lobs with it in preparation for the the vertical drive. 
This is where we kind of get a little bit iffy. We'd originally intended to do a large version of the, uh, uh, of the vertical drag racer, uh, reverting back to some technology we developed a couple of years ago with differentially throttled engines. We already have the hardware sitting on the ground for, for this vehicle. It's suborbital capable. Do you want to hit a couple more until that gets down the bottom? Uh, this one's man capable to 100 kilometers. It's using existing engines uh, and software. We've literally got hardware on the ground that we started welding on two, three weeks ago. So why the question mark on, the, uh, on this vehicle? Well, I think we've just about talked ourselves into, uh, into a different design. And one more slide. Uh, this is, uh, that's not our vehicle, by the way. It's, um, this was what was called OTRAG, developed back in the 60s and 70s by a, a German by, a guy by the name of Lutz, uh, who's a real heavyweight in terms of, uh, of engineering. Brilliant guy, he actually came and visited us a, a short while back, which was, was very flattering. Um, he's a heavy hitter. Uh, Von Braun actually joined his team after he retired from NASA for a little while. I'm not sure what happened with that. It may have had something to do with the fact that uh, Lutz is a brilliant engineer, but he has a bad choice of, uh, of business partners. Uh, he tried building this thing uh, in Libya with uh, a buddy, Muammar Gaddafi, which is not exactly your first choice of people to work with. Uh, hit another couple down there, and we'll finish this up. We're going to build, uh, we have to get rid of OTRAG, which has got some German definition. Um, we're going to call it the laser, large array of simple rockets. We've already got the conceptual designs done. We're starting to collect hardware, and I think this is the route we'll eventually end up with. Uh, 50 pounds to LEO, two-stage machine, for about two million bucks, and a thousand pound, three-stage, so about five million. Those are prototype prices. We think we can do it for those prices, buying one-off stuff. The whole idea of this, we like the Henry Ford idea. Design a module shake out all the problems with that, and then you just strap bunches of these together. The three-stage, I think, has 64 of these suckers side by side. Uh, it's an interesting concept, and we're gonna be pushing that. And we think there's a market out there for, uh, for some of those lightweight launches. That first one, the two-stage to Leo. Uh, Cindy, which I think gets the award for one of the most contrived acronyms this year, uh, is, was jointly uh, developed by uh, NASA, the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory, and the folks at UT Dallas. This package is built, it's a $7 million deal. It's sitting on the fence, it's been there for two years, I think, waiting for a ride. Uh, they, they've, uh, I think, trying to get it on a Pegasus at about 25 million uh, bucks a copy. Um, we think we can do it for a hell of a lot less than that. In fact, they don't, they don't even know when it's gonna, uh, gonna take off. I think that's about it, and I probably ran out of time for questions as well, did I? Uh, That looks like I did a great job again. No questions left. Uh, what, what, any kind of relationship you have with uh, Bezos activity or something like that? Do you guys have any chats? I uh, know Je Jeff, um, Jeff's another one of those uh, multi gazillionaire uh, software guys. Uh, he won't talk to anybody. I mean, we, we didn't know that he was in Pecos County until, uh, until we saw the, the, the stuff going through the same time as everybody else, I guess. Uh, but now that there's, uh, Jeff keeps himself pretty much to himself. Uh, we're self-financed as well. We're, um, John's quite happy with our current burn rate for as long as it takes, although I think this year and next will probably be the time where we, uh, we turn the cash flow going the other way. We were in this for a business. It started out as a hobby, but this is, uh, this is truly a business. We expect to, to all of us to be able to give up our day jobs and be missile men full time. Uh, but we'd like to see some cash flow going the other way. And we're not going to rely on, on uh, NASA's Centennial Challenge prizes. We intend to compete for as many as we can, but there are some other sources of revenue out there that we think we can turn this into uh, to a business. Do you have a number that you spent today? Yeah, in fact, we, uh, one of the things with John is, in fact, we fall foul of, uh, of ITAR regulations before too long. We publish everything on our website. You want to know what we're doing in October 2003? It's on there. Uh, right now, I think we've burned just under three million dollars, uh, which when I look at what we've achieved for, for what in this business is, is peanuts, uh, we've come a hell of a long way, and the burn rate isn't that much more now. Um, I think by the time we've, uh, we'll probably have that suborbital demo of the vehicle built, 
uh, for probably fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range. So it's not a huge extension of our uh, of our cash flow. On the Lunar Lander, uh, we, we've, in fact, it was interesting. I was at the uh, the RASTA conference uh, earlier this week up in Dayton that uh, was sponsored by uh, AFRL, uh, and there was a company there. We're going to have some, we looked at some some typical insulation. We don't need a whole bunch once it gets off the ground, um, but some thick thick insulation with a reflective foil on that, a lot of radiated heat in that area. And there was a company there called Aspen Technologies that got some really neat stuff. Uh, it's a nano-based compound. It's nano and everything nowadays. Uh, that looks like it will be about a quarter of the thickness and about a tenth of the weight. So we're we're probably going to try that out in the uh, in the coming weeks. It's only 12 weeks to uh, X Prize Cup. If you guys haven't got your tickets yet, go. It should be an absolute blast this year. Looking forward to seeing the guys from Exco with their planes, and there should be a lot of a lot of neat stuff. So we got uh, we got 10, 12 weeks to get the insulation uh, stuck on this thing. We'll be doing about an hour's worth of testing on uh, on this. Airborne testing before we uh, before we uh, sign off on it. Thank you, Neil. Uh oh, I'll talk to you outside. Right now. Uh, you all know what Neil looks like now. You can ask him more questions around the conference. He'll be here for a little while at least. Uh, sorry to rush things along, but we really do need to. We're running a bit late. Our next speaker is from an outfit that is also involved in a number of, of high-stakes competitions in this industry, uh, Chuck Lauer of Rocket Plane Kistler. Thanks. Um, let's see. Try the enter button. Enter. If not, just let me know and I'll advance oh. for you. Okay. Um, go go back one. Uh, no. Go 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 back, please. Okay. There we go. Um, uh, we have uh, been working very hard on our uh, NASA COTS proposal, but we've also uh, been uh, keeping the cranks turning on XP, which was our uh, first vehicle. When uh, when uh, Rocket Plane and Kistler got together, my uh, my, my feeling was that. Uh, it was a little unusual, particularly in the new space world, to see a horizontal takeoff and landing legacy company and a vertical takeoff and landing legacy company all come together. It was kind of like uh, dogs and cats sleeping together. But when you look at the, uh, uh, the synergies between the two companies and a lot of the synergies in the technologies, it really does make sense. The, uh, the suborbital world is a, uh, 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 is a world where wings and jet engines make a lot of sense. When you're going all the way to orbit, uh, it, it's, it's harder to make that case, and uh, so two-stage vertical really ends up being uh, the optimum architecture for the uh, orbital market as long as we're reusable. And both of the companies have got you know, 10, 15-year legacy of fully reusable systems. So there, there really was a lot of synergies between the two companies. Uh, this is where we're at right now on the XP, uh, latest version coming off the CATIA files. We have uh, modified the, 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 the loft has basically stayed the same since the last set of wind tunnel tests. We've been working on windows and configurations, both the uh, forward uh, window in terms of optimizing the uh, view from the pilot. Uh, uh, our uh, astronaut, John Harrington, is very, uh, uh, very particular. Very about how he sets up his cabin and, and uh, how his controls and the uh, uh, views and the flight uh, uh, control station work. So uh, we've been really working a lot on, on that end of the design as well as trying to optimize the windows uh, in the uh, passenger compartment so we get the best views. Next, please. Uh, the uh, system is a uh, 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 one-piece ship with uh, both jet engines and rocket engines on board. The uh, fuselage is a which we have stretched by a couple of feet and also moved the pressure bulkhead forward. We have, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the A version, which is a four seat. We do have a, uh, a, a stretch version uh, in, the, uh, in the works, which is essentially the same plane, but uh, with a bigger wing and a stretch fuselage to get us up to eight seats. But still, same basic operating uh, premise, the jets and rockets on board, uh, powered takeoff and landing under jet power and rocket 
for the zoom climb up to 100 kilometers. Next, please. Uh, we've done a lot of wind tunnel tests. We do, uh, we, we check the computer against the real world every step of the way. Uh, all of our analysis is done first uh, in the, uh, using CFD, but then we check the CFD against the wind tunnel test. We've had a tremendous amount of work done at Marshall Space Flight Center. One of our uh, uh, NASA partners has, uh, has been doing work with us on the Mach 4 and uh, uh, we now have validated our configuration. We've also determined that we have a natural stability coming back on reentry. So the uh, uh, the rutan soundbite about the uh, the feather being the only way to get back uh, is, is not exactly true. We're essentially doing the same thing without having to reconfigure our vehicle twice during flight. Next slide. The, okay. Uh, power locks kerosene. Uh, we're using um, a derivative. RS-88 engine. Uh, we have one RS-88 in our uh, uh, facility right now that is uh, going to be used for ground testing and it's a backup for the actual test flight engine. What the, the RS-88 was originally designed for 50,000 pounds thrust, so it's heavier than it needs to. We're doing a, uh, a, 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 a lighter weight version of that and also going to a regenerative nozzle for longer flight life and uh, uh, Polaris is doing that out in California. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, but it really the, the legacy of this engine goes all the way back to the Atlas program. So it's a very mature technology and what we're doing in terms of uh, life extension is, is relatively straightforward. Next please. Uh, we're, we're doing all this in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, the manufacturing facilities are in Guthrie. Our engineering offices are in Oklahoma City. Um, and we have a lot of hardware on the shop floor now. Our first test wing is uh, essentially complete. We instrumentation into it now and we're going to be taking that up to the National Institute for Aviation Research in Wichita, putting it into a big static test jig and uh, crunching it. So uh, we'll do the same thing with the tail structure. We'll, uh, you know, we build and test first and then build our flight articles all the way across uh, the board. Next slide. Uh, standard uh, XPRIZE uh, suborbital flight profile. Uh, we fly out under jet power, um, uh, go about 80 miles range at a subsonic cruise at 20,000 feet, turn around, point back to the spaceport, then light up the rocket engine for the zoom climb out. 70 seconds total rocket burn. We're at uh, three, three and a half Gs on the way up. Three to four minutes of zero gravity coming over the top. We have about a 4G uh, re-entry um, uh, load uh, coming back through, then uh, supersonic glide. We go subsonic at about 50,000 feet, and then we restart, do, do an air start on the jet engine thousand feet and uh, come back in under power uh, back to the spaceport. Next. Speaking of spaceports, uh, the Oklahoma spaceport got its license uh, approximately one month ago and that ground track that you see in the blue line there uh, is the first uh, overland uh, uh, rocket-powered flight corridor outside of military airspace. The, uh, Spaceship One was flying on the, uh, uh, the, the suffrage of Edwards Air Force Base, and so uh, a few high-profile test flights didn't really uh, get them too bent out of shape. Flying every day at Edwards would be uh, a little more problematic for the Air Force, so it was essential for us from a commercial standpoint to have a, a, an overland track that did not require that we uh, work around military schedules and we worked very closely with the FAA to make sure that this has happened. Uh, and we had to coordinate uh, between three different route centers plus uh, the space side of the FAA. So it was, uh, it was a major job but we got it done and it shows that the, uh, the airplane side of the shop and the space side of the shop at the FAA uh, uh, can work together and find that, uh, uh, that we can uh, enable uh, an inland commercial spaceport. Next. <clears throat> One of the new things that we have uh, come up with is to uh, use the XP as a launch platform for uh, uh, an expendable second stage. We uh, uh, essentially centerline store um, uh, on the belly of the plane <clears throat> and fly up to the 100 kilometer altitude, do a, uh, a zero G separation uh, between the, the second stage so we're not having to deal with any uh, aerodynamic loads at uh, separation of the package and then light up the uh, rocket engine. Next. Yeah. The, uh, the rocket that we're getting is uh, a, a new kind of high performance hybrid that's being developed in Japan. We have a strategic uh, partner relationship with an out 
Hokkaido called HASTIC, Hokkaido Aerospace Science Technology Incubation Center. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of the Japanese uh, uh, agencies are using uh, English acronyms, makes it easier for us. <clears throat> but this, uh, uh, the KAMUI is, is another one of these contor contorted uh, uh, um, acronyms, <clears throat> Cascading Multi-Stage Impinging Jet. Uh, KAMUI is actually an Ainu word, uh, uh, but uh, they, they cranked an acronym around it. But it's uh, LOX Poly very high uh, ISP and it's low cost and reusable and they were developing this as a sounding rocket when I first went over to uh, Japan a little more than a year ago I found out about this program and it was kind of a simple question during the cocktail reception about well if you guys are already flying to 100 kilometers from the ground and we can take the whole package up to 100 kilometers and launch it what can we do so next slide uh, and, uh, and and with the uh, uh, with that version of the end of the 1,500 uh, uh, kilogram thrust uh, 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 level, we can go from uh, a 70 kilometer uh, uh, release point up to over 400 kilometers uh, on a very uh, high arc. You know, we could we could get to the space station. We just don't have the energy to stay there on, on this particular loft. But it has a lot of other interesting applications because you can get about nine minutes of very high quality microgravity uh, in this type of a trajectory and do things like the uh, like they're doing in Australia with the high shot, where you you loft something up and then you uh, you you come back in at uh, roughly Mach 10. So a lot of scramjet research and a lot of, uh, uh, of other types of research that needs uh, similar types of reentry vehicles uh, is possible now by uh, flying them off of the XP and doing it at a very very affordable price point. Next slide. Um, and on the suborbital side, we really have uh, uh, focused on a global. Experience strategy where we would have suborbital spaceports uh, 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 around the world and the long-term goal is to start linking them up. The, uh, uh, and, and this is where really the uh, uh, you know, jet and rocket combination suborbital space planes I think ultimately will find their maturity is to be able to do point-to-point uh, -point service all the way around the world to be able to literally get anywhere on the planet in an hour and a half or so. Uh, in order to do that, you integrate with the terrestrial airport infrastructure because if you're out two hours from the middle of nowhere to get to the place where you can launch your rocket, you're basically losing all the time that you're gaining by flying a suborbital trajectory. So we think it's essential that you, you be able to take off and land the same way any other plane does with regular jets that don't have noise problems more than uh, usual for airports and using conventional 10 to 11,000 foot runways. But when you can do that, uh, you uh, the cities all over the northern hemisphere and, and uh, Anchorage becomes a, uh, a global hub for uh, getting anywhere on the planet um, uh, very quickly. And as the uh, operational experience matures flying from uh, point A to point A spaceports and then ultimately point A to point B spaceports, that gives us the data that we need to, uh, to talk about integrating space planes into uh, the uh, uh, conventional air an air traffic control system uh, to be able to, uh, to make this a, a new growth market for us. Next. On the Kistler side, uh, we have uh, uh, basically picked up where uh, Kistler left off when they uh, uh, closed down and uh, had to go through bankruptcy because of the uh, you know, drying up of the satellite market when they ran out of money. But we've now restarted uh, and we have uh, all of the contractors back on board. Next slide. Uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, and now, it is, uh, you know, working on the finals for COTS. Uh, we, we think particularly with uh, Mr. Bigelow and uh, uh, Genesis and, and future versions of his technology that you can make a business case for commercial orbital travel uh, with or without COTS, and that's our intention. Uh, but of course, to be able to uh, service NASA starting in, actually before 2010, we could be uh, offloading shuttle uh, MPLM uh, deliveries as early as 2009 and picking up some slack in the shuttle budget uh, moving forward on COTS with our first uh, COTS demo flight in 2008. Next. The, uh, the, the vehicle's three quarters built, which is why we can do this uh, uh, very quickly, um, and uh, all of the uh, contractors that you see down at the bottom there, uh, and, and actually quite a few more that have joined the team, many coming in. Both
uh, contractors and strategic partners uh, where we're getting, uh, we're getting cash investment from major aerospace companies coming into uh, a new space company. And that also, I think, is a first in the industry that the, uh, uh, the contracting and the, uh, and the money flow is going uh, in the other direction. And, and, and previously, Kistler would basically hired the best in the business and, uh, and was paying them. Now we're, uh, uh, we're starting to turn that around and have them be a little more entrepreneurial us and we, we really like that trend. Next. Uh, you can, okay, the more, more hardware shots, you can go through this pretty quickly. Uh, you know, the, this is all the stuff down in Mashoud. Next. Uh, the uh, Aerojet uh, uh, NK33 engines, uh, which are all uh, in storage in California. Uh, next. Uh, our initial uh, launch site is in Woomera. Uh, that, has, that has been approved by the uh, by the FAA and uh, in, in cooperation with the Australian government. Uh, we do plan a U.S. launch site. Uh, our preference would be Florida because that's where the customer is, but we're, we're looking at a, at a few different locations. Next. Uh, and so we, we think that there is a, uh, 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 you know, for a fully reusable system that can do satellite launch, which, you know, the, the, one of the strange things is that now, 10 years later, the, the LEO satellite market is actually showing signs of life too. So the original of the K-1 was to launch all those thousands of teledesic satellites, and, uh, and so now LEOCOM is coming back at the same time new markets like ISS Logistics and commercial uh, travel to commercial orbital destinations are all coming online. So the business case is much stronger now than it was back when uh, we started this in the mid-90s. Next. <clears throat> um, one of the things that comes from having a reusable system uh, that uh, can do the ISS flight profile is that you can fly space station hardware, you have to support it during the flight. So by definition, we have a microgravity free flyer research lab that is uh, compatible with all of the existing experiment hardware where you can fly a two-week uh, microgravity mission and not have to go to ISS. A lot of the people in the, uh, uh, that are looking at commercial microgravity really like this idea where you can check something out, but then you, uh, you, know, you fly it, you get it back, and you have uh, what amounts to uh, uh, an orbiting factory up and comes down and, and gets your uh, product back. Next. Uh, the, <laughs> this was originally the Return to the Moon conference, and we think that there is a huge case to be made. Others have made it as well, it, that uh, uh, using orbital propellant transfer or an orbital propellant depot and a reusable system, you can have a robust infrastructure for commercial travel to the moon and back and beyond. This is the real holy grail of commercial transport, to be able to have the entire Earth-Moon system serviced by commercial vehicles flying routinely and cheaply. Next. Uh, just as a little comparison here, uh, going back from the Saturn days to the, uh, the, the new monster uh, vehicles that are in the pipeline under the old space mentality, um, the, uh, the, the, K, the K1 is in between the stick and the shuttle there, and the K5, which is the same hardware uh, 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 put together, we could with, with any kind of a 